This is Yusuf Festus with another program. The subject I want to talk to you about today is one that I call God Allah. God Allah. By the way, we happen to own that website, GodAllah.com. You can get the reference for what I'm going to be talking to you today. It's going to be coming from materials that are on that website. So if you have a chance, go to the internet website of GodAllah.com. That's G-O-D-A-L-L-A-H dot com. I want to talk about this because someone could come up to you and catch you off guard and say, you're a Muslim, aren't you? And you're like, uh-huh, yeah, right, uh, whatever. So how come you guys worship a strange god, a moon god, something called Allah? Now, how will you deal with that? In other programs, we've talked about the approach, but it bears repeating again to mention how you approach the answer to this. You begin by saying, in a gentle and calm voice, and a smile on your face, thank you for asking me about my religion. And I know they're going to be like, huh? I'm not asking you about your religion. I'm really trying to attack you, you know. <laughs> But you throw them off guard. You say, thank you for asking me about my religion. In Islam, two very important things, the truth and the proof. We must always tell the truth. And we have the proof. The proof is recorded and memorized in the hearts and minds of over 10 million human beings walking on the earth today. We have the original sources of the Quran in the Arabic language. And the hadiths or teachings of Muhammad preserved, written down, and still with us today. The next thing to ask them is, did you know that a lot of times questions are not really questions, they have a statement that's incorrect within the question, and it has a question mark at the end of it. And then finally, while we're discussing this, and we're going over some of the materials that we have here about this subject, if you found that your source of material was flawed or had mistakes in it and you found that what we had was something obviously better and if you discovered truth in the answer that we have would you be willing at that stage to consider rethinking your position and making changes in your life because actually the most important part of being a Muslim is your subject. You've given us a great topic to talk about if you'd like to discuss it, would you? They'd be like, huh? Would you like to talk about this and find some truth? And if you found something good, would you like to do something about it? Well, at that stage, you can invite them to have a cup of tea. I remember when I came to Islam, that's exactly what my friend did. He was an Egyptian from a place called Cairo. And we sat together over a cup of tea, and he listened to me just go on and on. The Bible says so and so, the Bible says such and such, and I was preaching to him like you won't believe. I quoted him from the book of Genesis, quoted to him from the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, all of it, the Old Testament. Certainly I went to the New Testament. I remember asking him, do you believe in God? It was my very first question that I asked him. Do you believe in God? He said, yes. I said, no, nah, but you believe in Allah. He said, actually, that's God. I said, uh, oh, it is? Yeah, but you don't believe in the Bible. He said, oh, yeah. We have to if we're Muslim. So you believe in the Old Testament? He said, yes. Yeah, but you don't believe in the gospel. You don't believe in the New Testament. He said, oh, yes. I said, what? Do you believe in the prophets? Do you believe like Abraham? Do you believe in Moses? Solomon, David, he said, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you don't believe in the precious name of Jesus. He said, yes, I do. I believe in Jesus. I said, the miracle birth? He said, absolutely, it's in the Quran. I said, what? He said, the Quran. That's our book. Okay. Well, exactly what I'm telling you now is what happened to me then. I had to rethink my position. And I started thinking, well, this guy, he'll be easy to convert because he already believes what we believe. But here's the funny part. I had no clue what he believed. In fact, as I began to learn, I realized there were a lot of things I didn't know about what Christians and Jews are supposed to believe either. 
<laughs> but in any case, as we sat there together talking, I realized that I liked this man and he was very pleasant, easy to get along with, a nice way about him. As we did business together over the months that came up next, I saw in him character that I had not seen in a long time. He was honest, truthful, didn't break his word, was kind to people. He didn't, what we call sass people around, talk smart aleck or any of the rest of it. It was a very gentle, caring, considerate person. Of course that had an effect on me. And I listened to some of the things he said. But when we came to the subject of God, I remember that so well. Because we had a Catholic priest sitting at the table with us. Oh yeah. And my father was there. And he was a minister himself. I was a preacher. I had a different version of the Bible than my father though. My wife was there and she had a different version of her Bible from the rest of us. And of course, the priest has a totally different version of the Bible. But after discussing that, we kind of like put all that away and said, yeah, no, let's don't go into that, let's talk about the concept of God. And we asked, what do you guys believe about God? Well, the priest, he said, well, God is one, but he's three. He's the Trinity, and he's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. My father said, God is one, and the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son. And there really is no such thing as Trinity. However, we don't know exactly the status of Jesus. Okay. And then they came to me and said, well, what do you say about God? I said, well, God is like an egg, you know. You, uh, you've got the egg here, and it's got a shell. Inside the shell is the white, inside the white is the yellow. And these are three things, and they make one egg. And my friend said to me, so what if the egg is a double yolk? He said, could you accept that? That'd be four. I went, oh, well, wait a minute. Then I tried to compare it to an apple. An apple has the skin on the outside, the meat on the inside of that, the seeds inside. He said, yeah, but how many seeds are in there? Uh, forget that. Made other comparisons to a family, a father, a son, and a brother. Somebody could be all of these and still be one person. He said, yeah, it's true, but it could be more than that. He could be four people or five people. Because he could also be a brother-in-law. He could be a husband. He said, uh, yeah, well, well, what about water? Water is steam and ice, which is solid, and a liquid. All three are one thing, water. He said, can they be that all at the same time? Can it exist all at the same time as one? Mm, not really, no. So what is it that Islam has? And it tells us very clearly, There isn't anything like unto Allah, and He is the all-hearing and the all-seeing. His hearing and His seeing do not compare to the human being. That's why He's the epitome of these characteristics. As a matter of fact, Allah has many characteristics called Isma wa Safa in the Arabic language. And Allah doesn't compromise at all in those characteristics. He doesn't share his divinity with anything he created. He is one. He is unique. He is Ahad. Uniquely one. When I heard these words, I thought, hmm. But it was the Catholic priest, actually, who first picked up on this and understood it. And after visiting the mosque a couple of times, he left the priesthood. That's right. He became a Muslim. It wasn't long after that. In fact, within hours that I too had to reconsider my position and think, what was I doing? Where was I going? What was I saying? But then I go back and I look in the Bible again and on my own, I find the words that say, God is one. And you mustn't have any other gods beside him. There are no gods beside him.